Um, welcome to Time Tested Books. Uh, this is our first event in our new space. Thanks for uh, showing up. Uh, before we get to uh, Joe Boyd, um, I want to tell you that every Saturday we have children's story time at 10 a.m. So if you've got kids, bring them here. Uh, on um, and we're also having an Easter egg hunt on the 31st of. Uh, of March at 10 a.m. Uh, and the 4th of uh, April. So, again, that's for the kids. Do uh, you dress as a bunny, Scott? No, no, no. <laughs> and there, there will not be acid in the uh, Easter eggs, <laughs> so <laughs> stay home. Uh, and then April 21st, uh, Eva and Ginger Rutland are going to be here talking about uh, Eva's book, uh, When We Were Colored, uh, about uh, growing up African American in America. So, that's uh, April 21st. So. Uh, Joe Boyd has uh, been um, uh, gracious enough to uh, come here uh, on first first part of his, I guess, West Coast book tour. Uh, got lucky enough to snag him through an email um, to his publicist. And uh, he's going to be talking about uh, his career and his book, White Bicycles. And you probably know who he is, is otherwise you wouldn't be here. So I'm not going to waste any more of your time or my breath. And uh, Joe Boyd. Thank you. Um, I was asked, uh, Scott asked if um, we needed a PA system. And I said, you know, pretty live room. Um, so um, I hope everybody can hear all right. My stentorian tones will probably carry to the, to the back. Um, yeah, well, I, I wrote this book, and uh, I've started last summer in England going around to, uh, it was quite a, a, a strange experience because I, I got invited to do a lot of readings at music festivals and I hadn't been to music festivals for a very long time. Uh, or like, I'd been to some world music festivals but I hadn't been to sort of pop music festivals and uh, it was a shock. It was a real shock because they were so clean and so polite and so well manicured and uh, you know there was designer tents and there were parents with their teenage children and the parents were going to one stage and the kids were going to a different stage and it was very well behaved and there wasn't any mud and there was uh, like a sushi bar and there was uh, you know it was a real shock for somebody from the 60s you know who'd been to events where sort of like more resembled the Battle of the Somme. <laughs> and um, anyway, but I've been enjoying it. And uh, each one seems to be a little different. And sometimes I have somebody asking me questions. And, you know, but I've, I've <clears throat> I thought tonight I would, uh, because I, in, in Britain a lot, I, by the time I got around to a lot of places, a lot of people had bought the book. But here the book is just coming out, so I assume most of you probably haven't seen it or read it or anything. So I'll tell you a little bit about it and read a bit from it, and then um, uh, we'll uh, I'll you know ask for questions and things like that. Um, the book is full of, or not full of, but has a number of sentences which are sweeping, pretentious, uh, completely untrue, obviously. Uh, but, you know, and I, and I state them with such emphatic confidence that they're sort of self-satirizing. But behind it, there's a kind of a secret idea that I have that it's really true. And the first sentence of the book says, the 60s began in the summer of 1956, ended in October of 1973, and peaked just before dawn on the 1st of July, 1967, during a set by Tomorrow at the UFO Club in London. So that kind of sets out my stall of what I'm saying in the book. Um, <clears throat> and I thought, and then I go, I talk a little bit about that night of June 30th, going into the dawn of July 1st in London, which was a kind of intense moment, from which point 
afterwards I identify the decline of the idealism and the optimism and the whatever of the 60s. But I thought I'd start back in 1956 because the claim that the 60s began in 1956 probably needs a little bit of explanation, a little bit of defense here. And it, it really concerns a television show that I, I grew up in Princeton, New Jersey, and Princeton, New Jersey is about halfway between New York and Philadelphia. And we had the, what I thought was a thrilling advantage when I was a little kid of being just in the footprint of the New York television stations and the Philadelphia television stations. We could get both. We could watch, hey, we could watch NBC on either Channel 3 or Channel 4. But <clears throat> the one thing we did get, which was fascinating, in 1954 I discovered this program called Bob Horn's WFIL TV Bandstand. And it was a local show that had Italian kids from North Philly dancing to rhythm and blues records, basically. No black people in the audience, but lots of rhythm and blues artists would be guests, and there'd be a, a blonde high school girl standing next to Bob Horn interviewing the Cadillacs, you know. And, and you couldn't hear this stuff on the radio, a lot of it. It was great. And we were, my brother and I were completely hooked on this. Um, <coughs> Bob Horn delegated the chart countdown and the interviews to a rota of regular girls, always blonde and built. They were calm and professional while making announcements from the tacky podium, no waving to friends or giggling, and completely at home interviewing dangerous-looking pompadoured black men in sharkskin suits. It was not lost on us that these were probably the only occasions on American television in 1955 when white girls and black men could be seen in such close physical proximity. At the close of every program, the charisma-free Horn would thank the guests, the technicians, and his producer, Ernie Mamarella. We loved the name Mamarella. I would like to think we caught its curvaceous resonance, but it probably just sounded funny to us. One afternoon early in the summer of 1956, we were stunned to see a small, unremarkable man in Horn's place. He followed all the show's rituals without once mentioning the host's name. At 4.30, he simply said, this is Ernie Mamarella saying so long until tomorrow. Speculation began on the school bus the next morning and continued between classes. After lunch, a group of us were talking in the hallway when Pat Fisher, a clever black girl with reddish pigtails overheard our conversation. If you want to know what happened to Bob Horn, you better get yourself a copy of the Philadelphia Inquirer, she said, and disappeared into science class. After school, one of us went to the newsstand while the rest grabbed a booth at the local luncheonette. We examined each page until we came to the headline reading, Disc Jockey on Morals Charge. The position atop the podium could be earned, it seemed, by visits to a motel with Bob. Horn was accused of statutory rape and contributing to the delinquency of a minor. Sixteen years later, I was living in Los Angeles and running the music department of Warner Brothers Films. Ted Ashley, the company president, asked me to take a meeting with some famous TV producers who were pitching a series of music films. When I heard their names, I could barely contain my eagerness. In an Italian restaurant in Hollywood, I asked Ernie Mamarella about that day. News of Horn's arrest had arrived late in the morning, he said, leaving him no option but to fill in. Afterwards, the station bosses announced they were pulling the show. He pleaded and cajoled, pointing to its minuscule budget and remarkable ratings. They agreed to give him until noon the following day to find the most clean-cut, above-suspicion, white-bred, all-American disc jockey in God's creation. <laughs>
Mamarella told me he drove all over Greater Philadelphia that night, interviewing one leering, seedy, unshaven DJ after another. <laughs> he was on the point of giving up when someone suggested a late night jock in Reading, an hour northwest of the city. He arrived about two in the morning as Dick Clark, the other half of my 1972 lunch date, was spinning records for local insomniacs. For Americans, the denouement of this story lies at the heart of our popular culture. Clark, his white shirt collar outside his blazer, his smile as bright as a toothpaste commercial, started work the next day. Within six months, the network was pumping the show into every market in America. Arlene, Vinny, and their friends became teen icons. For the next three decades, American Bandstand beamed an ever blander version of popular music into millions of homes, making hits, creating stars, and homogenizing the dance steps and fashions of American youth. The WFIL's TV studios were in North Philadelphia, a few blocks from the now derelict station where express trains used to stop before turning west towards Chicago and St. Louis. Alighting passengers descended an iron staircase to the then noisy immigrant streets below. Clark and Mamarella told me how they rented an office above a barber shop opposite that stairway. Brill building men in snap brimmed hats and dark suits would catch the 11 o'clock from New York and join them for lunch at the coffee shop next door, bringing briefcases stuffed with cash or contracts giving Dick Clark Productions a share in the publishing rights to the B-side of a new single. That afternoon, their records would be played to millions of teenagers across America. In those days, payola was considered just good business. It still is, of course, but the methodology is more subtle. The smart money, the big money, was on white stars and safe music. This next paragraph I'm particularly pleased to read in this location, having heard a little bit of the history of this place and <clears throat> um, loving places like this, as I do. In a used bookstore in Albuquerque, New Mexico, many years after my account with Clark and Mamarella, in fact, just before I turned this manuscript into the publisher, I came across a, fever, a fevered but well-sourced history of the events of the summer of 1956, written by Stanley Blitz, a fan of Bob Horns. Clark, he claims, had been waiting in the wings at WFIL radio, not out in Reading, and the rape and drunk driving charges that cost Horn his job were a setup. WFIL TV was part of the media empire of Walter Annenberg, later Nixon's ambassador to London. And Mrs. Annenberg evidently hated the kind of music Horn played. The deeply religious station manager was also revolted by Horn and his hipster ways. By the time he was found not guilty of molesting the girl, Horn was a forgotten man in Philadelphia, although not by the many bandstand regulars who wrote to Blitz of how much they loved him and how the soul had lost its soul, the show had lost its soul with Clark. My brother and I were appalled by Dick Clark from his first day on air. Before long, prefab rockers like Fabian and Frankie Avalon started edging out the doo-wop groups. In a year or two, the rock and roll era was over, replaced by chirpy corporate pop. Like most non-conforming kids, we began to look further afield for our musical adventures. That's the way the 60s began. <laughs> Um, and of course I then, there was further interesting connection with Philadelphia. Uh, the way that my brother and I explored further afield, now that pop music was a kind of closed door for us, uh, was blues and jazz and collecting old records. And we were joined by a friend who moved to Princeton when I was about 15. Uh, called Jeff Muldor, and Jeff and my brother and I went around collecting old 78s and old reissued LPs and things and playing records obsessively. Um, um, let's see now. 
Where's that? In 19, when I, re I returned to Princeton at the end of the 1960 summer holidays prior to my first semester at Harvard, Warwick and Jeff were full of excitement. They had discovered a Philadelphia radio station with a late night jazz and blues show hosted by Chris Albertson. We were not alone. The revelation on the previous week's broadcast was that Lonnie Johnson was alive and well and working as a cook in a Philadelphia hotel. That weekend, we played track after track from Johnson's long discography. Born in New Orleans at the turn of the century, he came up to Mississippi to St. Louis and began a career as a crooning blues singer. His music evolved from country blues in the 1920s to an urbane Chicago style in the 30s and slick ballads in the late 40s. He was a brilliant and versatile guitarist who recorded <coughs> duets with white jazz star Eddie Lang and cut dazzling solos with Louis Armstrong's and Duke Ellington's orchestras. Listening to his seemingly numberless recordings, we tried to absorb the notion that he was just an hour and a half down U.S. Highway 1, living in obscurity. A borrowed phone directory revealed Johnson, Lonnie, at a North Philadelphia address, the blackest area of the city. We dialed the number. Is this Lonnie Johnson? The Lonnie Johnson who recorded Blue Ghost Blues in 1938? Yes? Would you come to Princeton and play a concert next week? Yes, I think we can manage $50. We looked at each other in amazement. We had booked Lonnie Johnson. We comm commandeered a neighbor's large living room and ordered our friends to attend and bring a dollar each for the kitty. When the day came, we borrowed Jeff's ram father's rambler and headed for Philly. Outside a downtown motel, a neatly dressed, gray-haired man stood by the curb with a guitar case and a small amplifier. Lonnie seemed as pleased to see us as we were to see him. He told of returning from a European tour in 1951 to find that his girlfriend had run off with his money, guitars, and record collection. Mm. Rock and roll was coming in and he didn't have the energy to fight it. He hadn't played a gig in eight years. When we reached rural Pennsylvania, Lonnie marveled at the fireflies in the summer twilight, the trees and green lawns. It had been years since he'd been out of the city. He answered our eager questions and laughed gently. When, a girl, when we ogled a girl walking beside the road, he added to our teenage lexicon of essential phrases by warning us to beware, quote, the fuzzy monster that causes all the trouble. <laughs> when we got to Princeton, the room was full. No one had the faintest idea who he was, but as soon as he picked up his guitar, all were entranced. At first, Lonnie brushed off requests for blues and sang standards like I Cover the Waterfront and Red Sails in the Sunset. White people always think Negroes just play the blues. I can sing anything. There was a beautiful black girl sitting in the, on the floor by his chair, and he started singing to her, flirting shyly. As the evening went on and everyone relaxed, the music grew more intense, and Lonnie began playing his old blues. Our friends and their parents edged closer to Lonnie's chair in the middle of the room. None of them had ever heard anything like it. <clears throat> we collected $100 for him, and he was so pleased he took the train home to save us the drive. The following year, he would start performing in coffee houses for the young white audiences he met for the first time that night in Princeton. Anyway, that's mm -hmm. next. <clears throat> so, um, and I suppose the, you know, I hesitate to try and thread themes through this book because it's, it's an anecdotal book and it's not really trying to drive home messages too much. Um, <clears throat> but I think, I guess the implication is that the, I mean, one of the key incidents that the publishers like to mention on the back of the book and that I've done a lot of interviews and talked about a lot over the years is um, how my first real job in the music business after I went to Harvard and I got out of Harvard and I went to work for George Ween, who was the promoter of European tours of blues and jazz and, and also the producer of the Newport Jazz Festival and the Newport Folk Festival. And he <clears throat> seemed to like the way that I <clears throat> handled myself on the European tours that I'd done for him. And so he said uh, that I should come to Newport in the summer of 65 and be his production manager. So 
I was sort of in charge of the logistics the night that Bob Dylan plugged in his electric guitar and everything changed. <laughs> and, um, you know, I mean, it's quite a long chapter, so I'm not going to obviously read the whole chapter. But I guess in a way, I, th I feel as if what was going on that summer was the culmination of what started in 1956. That, and, uh, you know, Dylan's book, I'm sure most of you have read that, is a fantastic book. And he talks about <clears throat> his fascination with the music of the past. I and mean, he started out being interested in rock and roll. And little by little, he discovered Woody Guthrie, and then he discovered the Harry Smith box <clears throat> set, and he discovered old country music and old blues. <clears throat> and, and I talk also about the, um, the clash that I was conscious of in the early 60s in Boston and Harvard Square and Cambridge between the New York approach to folk music and the Boston approach to folk music and how in New York it was very politicized. It was a kind of offspring of left-wing politics. And I always saw the Weavers and Pete Seeger, much as I liked a lot of their, you know, I mean, Pete Seeger is a magnificent artist, but I also was conscious of the fact that they could somehow take you know, a South African mining song and a Spanish Republican fight song and a blues from the Mississippi and a Appalachian tune from Virginia and an English ballad <clears throat> and play them all with a kind of similar strum and a similar set of harmonies, almost as if this was a way to prove that all men were brothers that by unifying the music stylistically, you were sort of pointing out how, how everybody was brothers under the skin. Which was fine, but it wasn't that exciting to me musically. Whereas in Boston, you met all these people, these eccentrics who, <clears throat> you know, were determined to learn exactly how Booker White tuned his guitar and played the slide, or exactly how Doc Boggs' clawhammer banjo style worked. And as I, there's one line I have in there, I said the people in Boston were, unlike people in New York, people in Boston were more interested in the differences than the similarities. And it was a way, in a way, you could almost say it was, I hate to think of it this way, but it's edging just ever so slightly in the direction of postmodernism in the sense of looking at music intrinsically just for what the music says to you without really thinking about the context and just how good it is. I mean, you know, is this, is this guy great? Is this guitar player great and is it worth listening to? It doesn't matter whether he's, you know, a downtrodden sharecropper from Mississippi or whether he was a professional, slick guy like Lonnie Johnson, you know, who never was a sharecropper, you know. Um, and, um, uh, so that the, in, and I was fascinated to read in Dylan's book that he seemed to be confirming a lot of what I was saying about how, in a way, his alienation from the political folk scene in New York followed this path in which you began to love music just for the sake of it. What's cool? What sounds good? What's really sexy? What's flashy? What's interesting? What's, you know? And that he, he adored, you know, he idolized Eric von Schmidt, who was the heart of the, who very, I don't know if you people are aware of the fact he died a few months ago, or just less, well, about a month and a half ago. Um, <clears throat> a wonderful man, Eric von Schmidt. And, uh, uh, and Eric was like the godfather of the Harvard Square scene. And uh, everybody, all the younger musicians were very, very influenced by Eric von Schmidt. And I also, mention Eric in the part about 1967 London that he was the first man I ever knew to take hallucinogenic drugs because he used to order mescal, uh, peyote buds from Moore's Orchid Farm in El Paso, Texas. You could right away, you could just send, <coughs> fill out a form, send off a letter to El Paso and get back a box of peyote buds and then stew them up. And Eric's point of view was that uh, you, you had to drink this 
the soup, which was pretty disgusting. And a lot of people just threw it back up again. And he felt that if you weren't calm, we didn't use the word centered in the 60s, but um, if you were calm enough to keep it down, then you'd earn the right to have the, the trip. So anyway, but that, uh, getting back to Newport, the, but in a way what Dylan was, what was happening that summer was the capturing of the high ground by, in a way, people that the New York political folk singers viewed as the enemy, the people who just liked music because it was great and who didn't think about the political context, even though what they were doing was full of political implications but they were subversive in a way that wasn't particularly appealing to the left. And during the course of that weekend at Newport, I mean, this, this, in, the, in the weeks leading up to Newport, you had this feeling that things were changing fast. The radio, all of a sudden, I mean, the radio folk music had always been on one, way off to one side. It wasn't, you know, from that day in 1956 when Bob Horn was fired, until July of 1965, well, actually, I mean, the Beatles kind of shook everything up a few years before, but still, there was this sudden feeling in July. First you had I Got You, Babe, by Sonny and Cher, which was just a pop record, but it was Sonny Bono imitating Dylan. And if Dylan was important enough to imitate by a guy who got to number one in the charts, you know, well that was kind of amazing. And then came Mr. Tambourine Man by the Birds, and then came Like a Rolling Stone. And these three records were all over the AM radio that summer. And you felt, driving around Newport getting ready for the festivals, that this was big. Things were changing. This was really, you know, the tectonic plates of culture were shifting. And, <clears throat> and then the festival began, and the old guard of Newport were obviously completely freaked out. They hated this record of Dylan's. They didn't know what Dylan was going to do when he came up. They were aware of how, how big a figure he was to the kids. They were, they just, you know, they were really in a, in, a, in a fix, and they didn't know what to do about it. Um, and I had set myself, I had this project that summer because I had been to the 63, I'd been in Europe in 64 in the summer, but in 63 I'd been as a fan, just I'd gone to the festival, and I'd seen Mississippi John Hurt and Doc Watson up on stage when the fog was rolling in off the bay and it was incredibly romantic and it was wonderful, it was an incredible moment. But the sound was terrible. And I determined that this year the sound would be good because I had it in my power to try and ensure that it would be good. And so I said to George Ween, I said, look, I'm going to make sure the sound, I'm going to put a lot of energy, that's what I'm going to spend a lot of my energy doing, to make sure the sound is good. And so I asked Paul Rothschild, who was the um, a record producer, a friend of mine, who had started, who was producing the Butterfield Blues Band, and he went on to produce The Doors and Janis Joplin. And um, <clears throat> he um, agreed to come up and mix the sound for nothing return for a place to stay and a few passes for his family. And he and I together sound checked everybody before they went on a workshop stage, before they went on the main stage. We had a clipboard and we had a chart and we had mic positions, settings, volume, everything. There wasn't going to be any harmony that you couldn't hear. There wasn't going to be booming noise. There wasn't going to, you know, everything was going to be good. And, um, and of course, we were, like everybody else, fascinated to know what Dylan was going to do, but also a practical reason. We had to find out because we had to, we had to set up the sound. So 
And there was another thing that happened that weekend, which was that the old guard decided they hated Grossman. They always hated Grossman. And they were, they, the thing that really freaked them out was this whiff of marijuana in the air. And they decided that the marijuana backstage with the musicians was, must be coming from Grossman. <laughs> <laughs> and after, um, uh, they tried to have him banned from the festival, and George had to explain to them that this was probably not a good idea. <laughs> Dylan would walk, Peter, Paul, and Mary would walk, the Butterfield Band would walk. <clears throat> We had the sound check just before the evening concert, at the end of the afternoon concert, before the evening concert, because Dylan couldn't get up to do a morning sound check the way most everybody else did. Dylan didn't get up before noon, so forget about it. On stage, I asked each of the musicians if they were happy with the positions and levels of their amplifiers. There were no stage monitors in those days and no direct feed of electric instruments into the sound system. A mic had to be placed in front of each amp to pick up the signal. I outlined the position of amps and microphones and the settings of the dials with the pink marker. I mentioned earlier that I bought a pink glow-in-the-dark uh, pen to mark the settings on the console and on the stage so that in the dark we could go right to the sound that we wanted. The sound we rehearsed had to be there from the first note. When the stage was cleared and the gates opened to the public, none of us left in search of food. We were too charged up with adrenaline be hungry. It turned into a beautiful clear evening with delicate pastel light. As consolation for the rain out, Butterfield was allowed to play for half an hour at seven while the crowd was still arriving. Dylan was scheduled for 45 minutes near the end of the first half, but we knew he had only three songs prepared. <coughs> the instant the previous group finished, we rushed on stage in the dark. I went from amp to amp, checking the pink marks. When the musicians were ready, I signaled with my flashlight. The introduction was made, the lights came up, and Maggie's farm blasted out into the night air. I ran straight out to the press enclosure. By today's standards, the volume wasn't particularly high. But in 1965, it was probably the loudest thing anyone in the audience had ever heard. A buzz of shock and amazement ran through the crowd. When the song finished, there was a roar that contained many sounds. Certainly, boos were included, but they weren't in a majority. There were shouts of delight and triumph, and also of derision and outrage. Musicians didn't wait around to interpret it. They just plunged straight into the second song. Someone tapped me on the shoulder. They're looking for you backstage. Alan Lomax, Pete Seeger, and Theo Bickel were standing by the stairs, furious. You've got to turn the so sound down. It's far too loud. I told them I couldn't control the sound levels from backstage and there was no walkie-talkie system. Where are the controls? How do you get there? Bikel demanded. I told him to walk out to the parking lot, turn left, follow the fence to the main entrance, come back down the center aisle, and he would see it there around road G. <laughs> a journey of almost a quarter mile. They looked daggers at me. I know you can get there quicker than that, said Lomax. I admitted that I usually climbed the fence. For a brief moment, we all contemplated the notion of one of these dignified and, barring Seeger, portly men doing the same. <laughs> then Lomax snarled, you go out there right now and you tell them the sound has got to be turned down. That's an order from the board. Okay, I said, and ran to the pile of milk crates by the lighting trailer. In a few seconds, I was standing beside the soundboard. It was like being in an, the eye of a hurricane. All around us, people were standing up, waving their arms. Some were cheering, some booing, some arguing, some grinning like madmen. A Bloomfield guitar solo screamed through the night air. Dylan's voice took up the last verse, hurling the words, <clears throat> hurling out the words, now the winter time is coming, the windows are filled, filled with frost. Grossman, Yarrow, and Rothschild were sitting behind the board, grinning like cats. I leaned over to convey the message from Lomax. Tell Alan the board is adequately represented at the sound controls. Yeah, Peter Yarrow was on the board. And the board member here thinks the sound level is just right, said Yarrow. <laughs> 
Then he looked up at me, smiled, and said, and tell him, and he raised the middle finger of his left hand. <laughs> Grossman and Rothschild laughed as I ran back to the fence. As I arrived at the foot of the stairway, Bikel and Lomax were watching Seeger's back as he strode off towards the parking lot. He couldn't stand to listen any longer. His wife, Toshi, was weeping and being comforted by George. I gave Lomax and Bikel the message from Yarrow, minus the finger. <laughs> they cursed and turned away. I went back to the press enclosure to hear the last song. <clears throat> um, and then I talk about the whole encore and how he came out with his guitar. He finished with It's All Over Now, Baby Blue, spitting the lyrics out contemptuously in the direction of the old guard. After the intermission, fate and poor scheduling conspired to ensure that a sequence of tired, hackney representatives of the New York school was paraded before the exhausted audience. Oscar Brand, Ronnie Gilbert, Len Chandler, and finally Peter, Paul, and Mary. Even Peter, Paul, and Mary's fans seemed to sense that they were watching something whose time had passed. Backstage, the atmosphere was somber and silent. Older performers in one area, younger ones in another. The significance of many watershed events is apparent only in retrospect. This was clear at the time. The old guard hung their heads in defeat, while the young, far from being triumphant, were chastened. They realized that in their victory lay the death of something wonderful. The rebels were like children who had been looking for something to break and realized as they looked at the pieces what a beautiful thing it had been. The festival would never be the same, nor would popular music, nor would youth culture. Anyone wishing to portray the history of the 60s as a journey from idealism to hedonism could place the hinge at around 9.30 on the night of the 25th of July, 1965. The two camps could not even bear to discuss an alternative finale to We Shall Overcome. So George had to come up with something. He played piano while an odd mixture of singers tackled When the Saints Go Marching In. Spokes Machian, who was a South African penny whistle singer, a penny whistle player who was there, took a penny whistle solo. Backstage, security had dissolved. On one side of the stage was a fat Providence disc jockey doing the jerk with Joan Baez. It looked horrible, a parody of the moving finales of previous years. Then I spotted Pete Seeger in unlikely conversation with Mel Lyman, who was the harmonica player of the Questkin Jug Band. <clears throat> the first real contact between the factions. Seeger asked me to ensure that the stage lights would be turned off at the end and one microphone left live on stage. The lights went down, work lights came on at the exits, and people started to file out. Mel came out and sat on the edge of the stage in the dark, pulled out a harmonica, and started to play Rock of Ages. It echoed out over the emptying arena without anyone being able to see where it was coming from. Mel was many things, not least a skillful manipulator of people. He had told the jug band that day he was leaving, reportedly to live in Woodstock as the Grossman Compound's marijuana curator. <laughs> <clears throat> Soon he would start his sinister avatar cult at Fort Hill in Broxbury near Boston. But he was always a wonderful harmonica player. Not a blues man like Butterfield, but an Appalachian mountain player translating the high lonesome sound of old time vocal styles into the mouth harp. By the time he finished the chorus of the first hymn, the first chorus of the old hymn, people backstage and in the audience had stopped wherever they were to listen. He kept playing, the melody becoming more moving with each repetition. People on both sides of the divide were crying quietly. After about ten minutes, he brought it to a close, put the mic down on the stage, on the edge of the stage, got up and walked off. No one clapped. People embraced, comforting one another then slowly gathered their belongings and went off into the night. The old guard, I think, mostly went to bed. <clears throat> the rest of us gathered at a bar where but Butterfield's rhythm section set up to play. As people began to dance, the somber atmosphere evaporated. The beer flowed, the party got wilder, the dancing more frenetic, 
and Sam and Jerome never flagged, that's Butterfield's drummer and bass player, never flagged as different singers and musicians came and went. When I left near dawn, it was still growing strong. I drove back to my mansion maid's room, thinking sadly about, we all stayed in those Newport, big Newport mansions, uh, thinking sadly about Pete Seeger. I doubted he would ever come to sympathize with what had happened. There was no point wondering whether it was for the better. All we could do was ride its ramifications into the future. Um, well, fast forward. Um, as I say, Monty Python and now for something completely different. <laughs> Uh, hello? The voice on the other end of the line was low and soft, almost embarrassed. In the years to come, I would get used to Nick Drake's way of answering the telephone, as if it had never rung before. When I told him why I was calling, he was surprised. Uh, okay, uh, I'll bring it in tomorrow. He appeared at my office the next morning in a black wool overcoat stained with cigarette ash. He was tall and handsome with an apologetic stoop. Either he had no idea how good-looking he was or was embarrassed by the fact. He handed me the tape and shuffled out the door. When I had some peace and quiet later that winter afternoon in 1968, I put the reel-to-reel -reel tape on the little machine in the corner of my office. The first song was not one of his best. I was made to love magic. The sentimental chord at the beginning of the chorus became one of the few moments in a Nick Drake song to annoy me. But that was the first time. Uh, but that first time it drew me in. It was, after all, the first Nick Drake, Drake song I'd ever heard. Next came the thoughts of Mary Jane, then time has told me. I played the tape again, then again. The clarity and strength of the talent were striking. There was something uniquely arresting in Nick's composure. The music stayed within itself, not trying to attract the listener's attention, just making itself available. His guitar technique was so clean it took a while to realize how complex it was. Influences were detectable here and there, but the heart of the music was mysteriously original. He came in the next day and listened as I explained what I wanted to do. He nodded and stammered, staring down at his hands and asked whether I minded if he smoked. I couldn't take my eyes off his hands. They were huge and stained with nicotine. The fingers strong and articulate with long, evenly trimmed nails caked with grime. He moved them constantly as he listened to my plans for him. My productions had until then been mostly with working groups, which meant simply recording what was already there. But Nick's compositions cried out for arrangements, an ideal setting for each song. One source of inspiration was John Simon's production of the first Leonard Cohen album. Simon had adorned the tracks with choruses, strings, and other additions that set off Cohen's voice without overwhelming it or sounding cheesy. Cohen's voice was recorded close and intimate, with no shiny pop reverb. Nick hadn't heard it, but he liked the idea of strings. He described performing with a string quartet at a Cambridge May ball, the first moment in our meeting when he became animated. His accent was at the aristocratic end of received pronunciation. Born in Burma, where his father uh, had worked in the colonial service, he attended Marlborough and was now at Cambridge reading English. I had met many public school boys, Chris Blackwell, for example, the head of Island Records, who seemed to have not an iota of doubt in their entire beings. Nick had the accent and the offhand mannerisms but it somehow missed out on the confidence. One evening, Nick played me all his songs. Up close, the power of his fingers was astonishing, with each note ringing out loud, almost painfully so, and clear in the small room. I had listened closely to Robin Williamson, John Martin, Bert Jantz, and John Renborn. Half-struck strings and blurred hammerings on were an accepted part of their sound. None could match Nick's mastery of the instrument. After finishing one song, he would retune the guitar and proceed to play something equally complex in a totally different chord shape. 60s London was not brimming with good arrangers. George Martin did his own. 
Denny Cordell and Mickey Most used John Cameron, but I felt he would have been too jazzy. I rang Peter Asher at Apple and asked him about Richard Hewson, who worked on the first James Taylor record. Peter spoke well of him and gave me his phone number. I sent him a tape of three songs. We paid him a visit. Nick looked at his shoes a great deal and muttered agreements to things I said. It must have been painful for him to go through this process, knowing Robert Kirby was back in Cambridge. But I never thought to ask who had written the arrangements for the May Ball, and Nick didn't volunteer. In those pre-computer days, there was no way to hear an arrangement before recording it. On the day of the session, Nick, engineer John Wood, and I sat in the control room as the musicians rehearsed their parts, trying to imagine how they would sound with the songs. When Nick joined them in the studio, I listened as carefully to his performance as to the instruments. I needn't have bothered. Nick was perfect every time. The arrangements, on the other hand, were competent, mediocre, and slightly fey, distracting from the, other so from the songs rather than adding to them. After we listened back to our morning's work, and I admitted it hadn't worked, Nick breathed a sigh of relief. You could see how wary he was of complaining. After a silence, I said, he said, I know someone at Cambridge who might be able to do the job. John and I looked at him. He's already done some arrangements for my songs. They, uh, well, they're not too bad. I wasn't sure to make what to make of Nick's suggestion. I wanted a world-class production. So the idea of using a fellow student struck me as a step backwards. Yet for the supremely cautious Nick to recommend his friend was impressive. I agreed to drive up to Cambridge the following week to meet Robert Kirby. What can you tell about a musician from meeting him? Kirby was hearty and jolly like a young music tutor, but beneath the banter there was no hiding the deep affection he had for Nick and his music. I liked their ease together. When Robert talked about the songs, he was down to earth and practical. Encouraged, I set a date for the recording. They started the session with a song I hadn't heard because Nick didn't play it on the guitar. As John Wood isolated the sound of each instrument, adjusting the mic position or the equalization, I could barely contain my impatience to hear the full sextet. The individual lines were tantalizing, unusual, and strong. When at last John opened all of the channels and we heard Robert's full arrangement of Way to Blue, I almost wept with joy and relief. So, um, any, who's, who's got a question about something, anything?